You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. So we're in this series, we call it Rooted, and what we're doing is we're working through what it means to be people who are rooted in Christ Jesus, rooted into him and growing in him. And as we look at it, um, we're, we're really unpacking and working our way through Psalm 1. Psalm 1, and uh, Luke chapter 4 plays a big part in this as well. But when we talk about being rooted, last week we talked about the three rhythms of, that happen every week in the foundry. First off, we want you doing devotions. They're, um, they're actually out in the boxes. You can grab them right by the entrance and exits there. On your way in or out, you can take the printed copies. You can go on foundrychurch.net, and you can get devotions. We want you studying the Word of God. We talked about that last week, that in order to do this, you need to delight in the law of the Lord. It needs to be the counsel of God in Scripture needs to be part of your life. But then we also understand that we have um, teaching-based small groups where we unpack the scripture we teach on in small group settings, and we want everyone to be a part of them. If you're gonna be part of this church, part of it will be in a small group. We know it's risky, but we think it's worth the risk. And the second and the third thing is weekly worship. It's this. We do this every week. And you may think, yeah, I just go to church, but it's so much more than that. And today we're gonna talk about that, and we're gonna really dig in and find out where we are. So today we're asking, where do you stand? Where do you stand? I don't know about you. Let me ask this. Has anybody here accidentally gotten caught up in a protest march or you end up walking through a city and find out you're part of a group of people you don't fully agree with? You guys need to get out of Zealand more, <laughs> right? <laughs> Come on. You can have some fun with this. Uh, one of my, uh, I'm not a huge Seinfeld fan. I know, I know my buddy Eric is, but I am not. And, uh, but I did like some of the episodes. One of the final episodes is... Um, where Cosmo Kramer, remember Cosmo Kramer, his hair, he's like, hey, he's kind of crazy. Um, he goes out um, of the apartment in Manhattan and kind of gets um, into the flow of the Puerto Rican Day March. This is in one of the final episodes. And he accidentally sets the Puerto Rican flag on fire. And so he's horrified at this, so he stomps on it to put it out. And I think, isn't that just life, right? It's just such, it was, it was actually a very controversial episode. They couldn't put it into syndication and play it again because there was an outcry from people from Puerto Rico because they burned their flag and stomped on it. But the reality was he got caught up in something he had no affiliation with. And he ended up standing with people and marching with people he had no real true agreement again with. He might not have been against them, but it wasn't really his identity. I can tell you this from a personal standpoint, 1995, I was in Beirut, Lebanon. Beirut was um, like Aleppo is now in Syria. There was a huge civil war. We had gone in as a mission team, and we were just working with some churches. And um, we were downtown Beirut. We were coming out of a restaurant. Seems like I'm always coming out of a restaurant, which may explain some medication I'm on. And... um, (laughs) And uh, so we're coming out of a restaurant, and there's a group of people, and they're walking towards a corner, and um, we're like, oh, you know, this looks awesome. Let's follow. So we, uh, you know, clearly, I'm 21. I'm sharp as a tack. We walk, uh, we walk towards this corner, and there is a building where, um, oh, I forgot the word again, a dirt pusher. Uh, bolt, yeah, a dozer. Oh, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> it's not my field, man. Um, we all have our gifts. Um, so you know what? This dirt pusher was in the middle of the city and it pushed over a lamppost to block traffic. And, um, there was a building that had been just, I mean, lit up by machine gun fire, RPG fire a few years back. They decided to tear it down. And so the, the giant bulldozer goes up and wham, hits one of the main support columns. And we're like, yeah, you know, because when you're 21, I'm still a boy at heart. I still am now. But you know, if you're going to knock a building down, I want to be there. I want to see. I want to be covered in dust, and I want to see it. And it's like, boom, boom, it started hitting this. And I'm like, tear it down, you know, and just having so much fun until I notice people start looking out the windows. I'm like, people are home. They, they're living there. Me being eternally compassionate was like, yes, the stakes just went way up. And everybody, like, and I didn't speak French or Arabic, so everybody's like chanting, and it seemed like we were having fun. And uh, people are like, dropping TVs out and people are trying to catch them. I'm like, oh, yeah. And uh, then a couch came out a window and I'm like, truly, this is the best day of my life. Like I'm having so much fun until someone held a child. 
out a window. And it was like a flash moment where I realized this is their home. They have been war-torn, war-ravaged, and now somebody hadn't decided to tell them that everything they have is up for grabs because their building's going away. And I remember realizing that I was standing with a group of people who had been hardened by a war, but I hadn't. And I realized that what was funny and happening in this world was actually really broken and I found myself wishing I wasn't there. I found myself trying to excuse myself and get back because the panic on the faces out of the windows, the people streaming out of the building, it was, more, it was enough to make you sick and you didn't, I didn't realize at that moment what it was standing for. When we stand, it matters. We'll see it in um, Psalm chapter one. We'll see the rhythm of this and the importance of it. So here's what it says. Blessed is the one who doesn't walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way, the path that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. But the person who is blessed delights in the law of the Lord. And on that law, they meditate day and night. That person, the righteous person who meditates on the law, is like a tree that is planted by streams of water. It yields its fruit in season, and its leaves do not wither. Whatever they do prospers, but not so the wicked. They are like chaff. Remember what chaff is? It's like the onion paper, the really fine uh, skin around the kernel of wheat. And when you beat the wheat stalks, the kernel comes out, the chaff is left, and it's easily blown by the wind. They are, the wicked are like the ones who are blown by the wind. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners will they stand in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Last week, we talked a little bit about what it means to be the wicked and what it means how they're apart from God. And we'll talk about it a little more. But today, we really took look at what it means to take a stand to stand up and to actually for purpose and reason and integrity stand. To stand up and actually engage. Scripture says, blessed is the one that does not, that does not stand in the path that sinners take. What is Scripture saying in that? Last week we talked about the ungodly. And the wicked, and we, un we unpacked what that means, that the, the wicked is not this green hook-nosed witch, but it's actually a person who is willfully apart from God. They don't adhere to God's um, voice, they don't listen, they don't see the need for his lordship, and they refuse the counsel of God in Scripture. We understand as righteous people, we meditate on the law, which is the counsel of God in all of Scripture, and we hold to it. We let it guide our lives. So... For those who don't look to direction, we talked about them this week, this last week. But for this week, we talk about sinners. What is sinners? I want you to think of an ever-lowering scale. The wicked are up here, but then sinners are kind of a step down. It gets a little worse. It gets a little darker. Sinners live a life willfully apart from God. Their life is intentionally kind of against something. Maybe when you were 13, you did something stupid. Your friend said, hey, try to steal a big gulp from 7-Eleven, and you did. Maybe you got caught, and you snuck out, and then you got nailed, and you're like, oh, and you did it one time. You stole something, whether you got caught or not, and you're like, oh, this is the worst. I'm never doing it again. But a sinner would be someone who makes a way of life of doing that. Makes a way of life that I actually saw somebody at Family Fair the other night with my daughter. He was just kind of cagey walking around the store. And um, I just noticed it, I don't know, it was just kind of weird. And then I saw him grab a, a Frappuccino. He cupped it in his hand. And the registers are right here. And he walked out like this with it in his hand. He was headed out the door. I awesomely balked and didn't know what to do. But I look at him, I'm like, he made a way. He's, he's doing, that. people make a way of life of doing that, of hurting others, of stealing, of just being, well, on a path, a path that says I'm willfully apart from God. Their pattern of sin is their MO. It's what they do. Someone who justifies their adultery, their idolatry, murder, stealing, um, hurting people, whatever it is, they make a way of life of it. That's what we talk about when we say standing in the way of sinners. They do what they can to get away with everything possible according to the world's standard. They cheat, steal, and thieve, and if they don't get caught, then it was okay. That's the mentality of sinners. We are called to the other end of that, to the other side of that, and we ask the question, okay, who should we stand with? As Christians, this is where we're really gonna lean in, and we're really gonna understand 
that if we're not to stand with sinners, which by the way, all of us were sinners. Some of us still live in sin, willfully, and we choose those paths and we continue down them, but we've all been sinners at one time. But where do we stand as the family of God? Here's what I wanna tell you today. You stand together. That's why this matters. What we do on Sundays and Monday really matters because what do we do here that we don't do elsewhere? Well, how many times this week did you stand somewhere around people and sing? <laughs> right? We just don't do that. You're in line at Myers, and you're like, don't stop, believe. And no, and I, uh, no, you don't do that. It'd be weird. I'd be like, dude, I want milk. Stop being that person near me. Others are looking. Like, you don't stand and sing. Maybe in your car you sing, but when's the last time you stood with other people and sang the same song? Over, over and over again. Like, when's the last time? There's something significant that goes on in standing up, linking arms, and saying this matters. It matters, and it's part of the rhythm of God. It's important to gather on Sundays and Mondays. We join together to stand in the, wor- in the worship of God. We show by our active participation who we believe in and who we trust. By worship, we stand together with the voice of other Christians and we give out and give back, which is his only, our worship. We stand together for it. See, I think worship is our reminder that we live apart from the clause of getting away with whatever we can. That is not our clause. We're not here to get as much as we can and break as many rules without getting caught as possible. That's not how it goes for us. We live under the clause that we stand together in worship to recognize the lordship of God under the authority of God. We stand together to praise him and praise him who is above all things. When we understand the weight and the responsibility and the opportunity of gathering together so that we're not alone in our faith, you are not alone in your faith. You stood just a moment ago repeating the verses to a song, singing together. And the reality is you don't stand alone. You stand alongside the great company of saints every week, and it really, truly matters. And it's not something we invented Remember last week we talked about how Jesus in his temptation from the devil was tempted in his moment of weakness. I want to parallel that once again. Remember last week it said that Jesus, after he was baptized, was filled with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit compelled him into the wilderness where for 40 days he ate nothing and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil came to him when he was hungry and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. What did Jesus say? It is written, which is really what we're calling, that's the call to arms to be rooted in the word of God. That's what Jesus used to defend himself. Man doesn't live by every, by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Satan takes him on another trip. During this fast, during his exhaustion, it says the devil led him up to a high place. And in that high place, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in an instant. Now, I want you to think of it like Marvel's Avengers movies. You know how they just seem to fill the screen with every possible image on earth in one clip and the sound and it's reverberating. I want you to get that kind of image. When Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth in their splendor, in their glory, in their wealth, in their idolatry, their pomp and circumstance and everything, he shows him every good thing this earth has to offer and he turns to Jesus and says, I'll give it all to you if you'll do one thing. Worship me. Bow down and worship me. Jesus gives the call again to us to be rooted in Scripture. He turns to the devil and he says, it is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Which tells us our worship matters. Our worship matters. That's Luke chapter 4, about 1 to 8. But Luke chapter 4, verse 16 has this phrase in it. On the Sabbath day, Jesus went to the synagogue as was his custom. Jesus went to worship every week. Jesus was rooted into the greater community of faithful Hebrew people. He would have sung the Psalms. He would have prayed the prayers. He would have listened to the law of God, to the prophets. He was raised 
in what we would understand as a church setting. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his custom. It tells us this, that what we're doing here matters. We are participating in the obedience that Jesus Christ lived in. He lived in a rhythm and a cadence and a discipline that gathered together with a full body and said, we're in this together. We're gonna link arms and we're gonna step forward and we're gonna push back the kingdom of darkness by our unity. And we're gonna live into that. We see Jesus did that. So the question becomes, who are you standing with? So ask yourself the question, who are you standing with? Who do you stand with in this life? And, and really, what does it feel like to stand with someone? Where do, where do you feel at home? I did this at first service. Hopefully you're more well-behaved. Um, at first service, I said, you know, if you're a fan of University of Michigan, go blue, right? Or, no, nope, no, we're not, we're not changing colors. Um, I know, somebody's like, go green. I'm like, silence in the back. Um, but, uh, so blue, you offended second service. Green was first. Um, and then I said, you know, so who's been to Spartan Stadium? And you go there and you're, and you're just a honk for your team, right? You just love them. You love them and you walk into that stadium and you're like, oh, you're home, right? You just come in and you're like, yes, yes. I remember for me, um, I moved a lot when I was young. The one place I know but had never been to was Mile High Stadium. Now in Vesco Field, now Sports Authority Field, now bankrupt something else. But the field matters, right? The field matters. I went there with my boys a, little, a couple of years ago. I walked out onto that field and I was like, I love it so much. Like I got super emotional. My dreams, my, my nightmares and my dreams, that field, that field, I had watched it. I loved it. I came home, right? If you're a Michigan or, or Michigan State fan, you tell me there's not worship there. You tell me you don't stand with the crowd. Hail to the victory. That's where, you, right? It matters where we stand. It matters. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong that we get into it. I think it's awesome. It's just not everything. It's not everything. But when I say, where are you at home? Where's the place you can just let loose and just kind of be? Who are you standing with? I had a friend in Mercy Ships. He was my roommate named Brian Howard. He was kind of awesome, a little bit emo. You know, a lot of Doc Martens in that phase of my life. He wore Doc Martens. I think he wore eyeliner, but I wasn't comfortable with that. Um, so <laughs> this is not my thing. Um, but uh, Brian was telling us, uh, Erica and I, we had just met, and he was telling us a story of um, one of his friends invited him to a concert. So he goes, and uh, the opening act goes through. He didn't know who was playing, and he said, all of a sudden, there was a descending darkness. It was like a weighted blanket. It just darkness came over it. And he said, it was so unnerving because I felt like I was glowing. Think about that. He said, there was a sense of evil and weight, and darkness, and I felt like I am the only one here who's not in agreement with what's about to happen. He had no idea of what was coming. And he said, I felt like I was glowing. If I remember the story correctly, he took his friend's hand, they sat down, and he literally, like they huddled together and prayed. And then off a freshly cut album of Antichrist superstar, Marilyn Manson walked onto stage. And he said, I was terrified. And he could not stand in that place and be part of the pulsating worship of everything that was against God. And he said it was terrifying. We have to look at our stories and understand that we stand to worship. We gather here today to worship. We can't be held by the ethic of the world and their standards of how much we can get away with. We stand here in worship and we recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ, the authority of scripture, and our call to unity in this place to become more like Christ and less like us. Not through moralism and good behavior, but by participation in the word of God, in the community of God, and the purposes of God through it. We live under this calling. And so when I ask you, who are you standing with, you and I should probably feel a little bit of weight 
around us that goes, probably not all the right things. We stand for things that have no gospel affiliation. We pour our passion and our, our effort into it, and it has no gospel echo. Do you stand here? What things try to keep you from joining in in worship? Because worship matters. And you can sit there and say, well, Eric, I, I'm more stoic. I don't sing. Get over it. You're in worship. And it's not about you. It was never about you. God didn't say, it's okay, I made him stoic. He doesn't sing. No, he probably have a good voice. Sing stoically. Be part of it. It's worship. We're gathered together to get over ourselves and get our eyes on him. We are called here. We have to be people who understand that when we stand together, we stand in the unity of the faith. We stand together holding up the broken and the hurting with the lives of the strong and the healthy. And by the way, those parts move. Some of us have good days while others have bad, and we hold them up. We link arms, and we do this every week, not out of religious repetition, but out of faithful living in the covenant community of God, rooted in the word of God, but also rooted into his community. Rooted in being here to stand up and say, you know what, this week got a lot of my life, but this day gets all of my worship. It resets my life, and I stand with a company of saints and sinners alike, and I give my allegiance to one. We are called to it. There is no excuse apart from it. I've heard hunters say to me, well, I appreciate church, but you know, I find God in a tree stand. Fine, that's not church. The only thing standing, apparently, is a tree stand. That's not what we're talking about. And I don't mean to pick on hunters. I like to hunt. But they're like, you know, I just find, you know, I find God in the beauty of creation and different things. I'm like, you're about to shoot creation, so it seems a little sacrificial, but I don't want to argue, right? And don't get me wrong. I like to hunt deer, unless you think that's offensive, and then I still like to hunt deer. Um, <laughs> but the reality is, for us, like, we, well, I find church here. No. No. We find the community of God here and gathering in little pockets all over this globe because we, like our Lord and Savior, have a custom. We have a discipline. We have a gathering custom that says we are together in church standing in worship just like Jesus every week, as was our custom. It's who we are. It's not just what we do. Gathering for worship is strengthening us, and I've got to ask you, what keeps you from joining in worship? I don't know what keeps you. But I can tell you this, the excuse doesn't hold water when it comes to the high calling of a life of worship. It doesn't matter what keeps you from it. It only matters of will you get over it and get through to the point. Get to the point of why you're here. What keeps you from coming at all or participating? I don't know what it is for you, but I think it's important that you recognize being here isn't the point standing in worship together, being part of the movement of God, this spiritual posture that calls us to be united in focus, in mission, and in participation. We have to understand that we can't miss the opportunity to stand with other believers. Do you realize that there are Christians the world over who would literally give everything they have to sit in this room safely and peacefully and worship God, and they wouldn't be mad if it went over an hour? And I'm not, I, trust me, I don't like it to go much more than an hour, right? It's hard, you, you have busy lives, I get it. But there are Christians dying for their faith and serving God and gathering in tiny little dark rooms reading the scriptures on a whisper's note to be part of the family of God gathered. And we're like, I don't know. I just feel kind of tired and I don't know if I'll like the cookies. <laughs> Isn't it more? Don't miss the opportunity to link up and become bigger than just the sum of our parts. We are the church gathered, called, purposeful, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the very thing that darkness can't stop to shed the light of Christ on this world. And we link up and we push forward into this world, sharing the gospel, and it starts in this. We start in the word of God, we continue to the big gathering, we understand this matters. Don't miss the opportunity to do what David said. What David said, he says, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in the path of sinners. And Jesus gave us a different path, a path that has a rhythm, has a cadence, has a worship-focused life. Every week, gathered 
Don't just come to church. Come and be the church. Come and live the church. Come and experience the church linked up, powerful, purposeful, and leaning in against the culture and saying, no, no, you don't define us. We transform culture by the Holy Spirit that lives in us and the gospel that has changed us. Amen? Amen. Justin, why don't you guys come up? As we get ready for worship, I want to say that I do understand that it's hard sometimes to sing. Maybe you're gifted like me and your voice sounds like cats in a blender and it feels bad. And I'm sorry if you've been given that gift. I, I don't have a really good voice, but Oscar will tell you, I sing. It's unfortunate, but I sing. I give it my all, not because I necessarily like the song sometimes or anything, but I do know this. There are times I stop singing and I just listen because to listen to the crowd sing, there's something to it. When grown men and women just sing, we just sing, because what else is there to do? If, if you don't like singing, I've got super bad news about eternity in heaven, because apparently we are going to stand around the throne of God, and we are going to sing like there's no tomorrow, because there's not. It is a forever lasting. We will cast down all our actions, all our faithful obedience before the Lord, and we will sing the eternal refrain, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And if you don't like songs that are repetitive, heaven's going to be tough because right after that we sing holy, holy, holy. And it'll go on and it'll go on. It'll be the chorus of heaven echoing through the halls of eternity. And here's the fun part. It starts here. It starts now. Stand up. Let's sing. The lie of the enemy has never changed. Never. It says this, you're the only one. You're the only one addicted to pornography. You're the only addict in the room. You're the only one with a failing marriage. You're the only one with children in crisis. You're the only one. You're the only one. You're the only one. You're the only one. Look around. You are not the only one. We stand in the power of Jesus Christ to be what he died to make us, the church, vibrant, alive, unbroken, by the power of the path of sin because that path was interrupted by the blood of Christ. We live together. We stand together, not because it's ritual, but it is our tradition in the faith to link up and be reminded that I am not alone. I am not the only broken person, but I am redeemed and I'm not the only one of those, right? I am not the only person who was a sinner, but I am in the company of saints, not because we're moral good people, but because the Lord Jesus Christ, by his blood, his life, death, and resurrection has redeemed what was lost. This gathering matters. It is not something we as a church want from you. It's something we beg for you. It's something we want for you. If there's anything that hinders you in being in worship, throw it aside and stand together. Honestly, if it's giving, don't give. Let God work that out in your heart. Don't get, I, I don't care what it is. Whatever the hang up is, lay it down and look around for just a minute and understand the lie of the devil will never change. You're alone, it's only you. You're ashamed, you're bad, you're this. You're alone, you're alone, you're alone. You are in the company of the church. The saints standing together for one purpose, to declare that God, you are so good. His goodness has never failed. His faithfulness will not be broken. What he promised to do, he will do. But this first is our calling, our benediction, our hope that Jesus hasn't left us alone. The word of Christ says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you will find your life. You'll recover your life. I'll teach you how to live freely and lightly. Walk with me, work with me and see how it's done. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't put anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, but I will teach you how to live your life freely and lightly. May that be true of you as you gather and stand together on Sundays, as you live in the word throughout the week. May the grace, the peace, and the hope of the gospel be yours. You stand in the company of saints. And I would love to see that be not only your practice, but something you're set free to worship as a part of. Because this is one of the defining traits of who we are. The church standing and gathered, lifting up but one name. 
the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that name, I dismiss you. My friends, the church must leave the building. You are free to go. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.